Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Q2 FI24 Earnings Conference Call of HDFC Asset Management Company Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during this conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. From the management team, we have Mr. Navneet Manod, Mr. Nawazad Sirwala, and Mr. Simil Kanuga. I now hand the conference to Mr. Simil Kanuga. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good evening, and thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, before we dive into specifics, uh, we would like to highlight a change in reference to some of the data points in our presentation. Um, as against our usual schedule, uh, results have been advanced by a week or two. Uh, the change was made to ensure synchronization with the quarterly results reporting of HDFC Bank. Uh, it is important to note that as of now, not all the necessary industry data for September is made available. In instances where September data is still pending, we have substituted it with August data. We have done this to present the most accurate and timely information possible. We'll refresh our presentation in the forthcoming day once necessary data for the month of September is released. And the same will be made available on stock exchanges as well as our website. Let us start with uh, some level of industry level information. Uh, the quarterly average assets under management continued, with, uh, continued its impressive uh, growth, reaching rupees 47 trillion, marking a 20% YOI increase. Actively managed equity oriented funds are getting nearer to the 50% mark of the total AUM with QA AUM of rupees 23.1 trillion, a notable uptick of rupees 18.4 trillion recorded a year ago. Significant, 20, signifying 26% YOI growth. During this same period, the Nifty 50 price return was 15% and the Nifty 500 price return was 17%. This indicates that the industry's growth outpaced the benchmark indices and attracted significant inflows. Debt funds displayed healthy interest with QAUM surging to rupees 10.3 trillion in the quarter ending September 23, up from rupees 8.8 .8 trillion in quarter ending March 23. B30 MAUM category continues to exhibit a healthy growth rate. This highlights the high level of acceptance of mutual funds even in B30 markets. The share of B30 in the overall MAUM and equity MAUM remained steady at 17 and 27% respectively. Systematic investment plans continued their upward trend, recording flows of rupees 160 billion in September 2023, a notable increase compared to rupees 130 billion in corresponding month of the previous year. Over the quarter, SIP flows total to rupees 471 billion, constituting 27% of industry's total gross equity flows. Now we'll move to our company's performance. Uh, quarterly average AUM crossed the rupees 5 trillion for the first time and reached rupees 5.25 trillion, a growth of 22% YOI. Our market share demonstrated positive momentum with overall QAUM market share of 11.2% and when we exclude ETF, the number is 12.5%. Our actively managed equity-oriented fund, AUM, based on closing basis, crossed the figurative milestone of rupees 3 trillion and saw an increase of 40% YOI as against 28% for the industry, resulting in increased market share. Our quarterly average AUM for debt fund moved to rupees 1.37 trillion, up from rupees 1.18 trillion in March 23, a growth of 16% or rupees 0.19 trillion. Our quarterly average asset mix continued its tilt towards equity, with equity-oriented funds now constituting 58% of our AUM, significantly higher than that of industry at 51%. Furthermore, even in terms of customer profile, we have remarkably higher tilt as compared to that of the industry in favor of individual investors. As for August 23, individual investors' MAUM accounted for 68% of our total monthly average AUM, higher than the industry average of 58%. Our unique investor base continues to expand, reaching 7.9 million unique investors, at end of September 23, as against 40.4 million for the industry. This suggests that nearly one out of every five investors have reposed their faith in HDFC mutual fund. Over the last one year, industry did add 4.4 million unique investors. During the same period, we added 1.8 million unique investors. In September 23, we processed 5.86 million systematic transactions, amounting to rupees 22.4 billion. For sake of comparison, the corresponding amount in June was rupees 18.9 billion and for September 22 was rupees 14.3 billion, 
We have seen a growth of over 50% on YOY basis. We have further expanded our product portfolio, especially in the sectoral thematic space. During the quarter, we launched non-cyclical consumer fund, transportation and logistics fund, technology fund, and pharma and healthcare fund. We also launched the Nifty One Day Rate Liquid ETF. Uh, our wholly owned subsidiary in Gift City has secured all necessary approvals and licenses. We have five documents and plans to launch first set of funds during the current quarter, subject to necessary regulatory approvals. Uh, finally, moving to financials. Uh, our second quarter revenue growth from operations came in at rupees 6.43 billion, reflecting 18% YOY growth, while other income amounted to rupees 1.22 billion, as we did experience a healthy mark-to-market growth on our investment portfolio during the quarter. Our operating profit for the second quarter came in at rupees 4.67 billion, a growth of 20% YOY. Operating margin for the first six months increased to 35 basis points as compared to 34 basis points in the first quarter of the current fiscal. Uh, the effective tax rate has rationalized in this quarter. Last quarter, many of you would remember, it was lower primarily due to increase in deferred tax charge attributed to holding certain period, holding a period of certain investment transitioning from short term to long term. Uh, so thank you so very much. Uh, Navneet, Nauzad and I are very much available to take questions. Uh, Nirav, I think we can, we can open up for questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants, you may press star and 1 to ask a question. The first question is from the line of Sandeep Agarwal from Naredi Investments. Please go ahead. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Uh, my question is regarding SIP flow. Uh, it's approximately 16,000 crore uh, and uh, increased by 36% year on year basis. And so, uh, SGFC SIP flow is uh, increased by 56% year on year basis. Any specific reason you want to share for this higher growth? So overall, I think uh, it's been helped by a variety of reasons, including the improvement in performance, uh, products getting approved across all wealth managers, our focus on all each and every channel, be it the mutual fund distributors, be it RIAs, fintechs. Uh, banks and of course uh, LGFC banks. I think it's been quite helped by variety of other initiatives, be it on the marketing side, on digital side, product uh, communication side, etc. And this continues to remain a very high focus area for for us, and and we we remain quite focused as a team on continue to build our systematic transaction book. Uh, so my next question is: uh, So what percentage of growth you expect in the next two years? In SIP flow, uh, any <laughs> rough right, number uh, for industry and SDFC MC? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, over the last several years, we have been seeing continuing, uh, you know, improvement in the overall SIP flows in the industry. I think combination of factors, I think a great track record of the industry over a long period of time, which is acknowledged by a lot of investors. Uh, I think it's focused on uh, transparency increased transparency of the product relative to any other uh, investment vehicle for people that's giving more confidence. Uh, I think it's technology, making it easier for people to invest, easier to get more information. And of course, the tremendous focus of the industry and all of us, uh, the players in the industry, on, on investor education. So I think a couple of these factors have led to this growth. And despite the volatility in the market over the last four or five years, the most heartening feature in our industry has been uh, continuing step up in the in the SIP flows month after month. And uh, we have always been highly focused. I think over the last five, seven years, industry has grown a lot on that front, and, and we have grown. But even much, much before SIP or systematic transactions became a household name, it is DFC, AMC, we have always been very, very focused on promoting the concept of disciplined investing uh, and then long-term investing through SIP and, and systematic transactions. Uh, thank you, sir. 
Before we take uh, any other question, I thought I'll take this opportunity uh, to mention something which is very, very close to our heart at each and every one at SDFC AMC. Uh, during the course of this quarter, we launched our SDFC Cancer Cure Fund. Uh, as everybody would know, the returns from the fund are shared with Indian Cancer Society. We could raise over 1.8 billion in this fund from over 1,600 clients, and we remain very, very thankful to each and every one of them. Uh, so I'm very thankful to, to SEBI, uh, to our distribution partners, to our investors, and of course, uh, the entire team at LTFC AMC and all the well-wishers. Uh, we are very proud that uh, the first fund that got launched in 2011 and then second series was in 2014, followed by 2017. And after a gap of a few years, we have finally have been able to launch the fund and continue the great legacy. This has been one of the greatest innovation by any AMC in the world, and we are very proud that we are continuing that legacy. So I thought I'll take this opportunity to thank everyone. Thank you very much. Next question is from the line of Kunal Tanvi from Banyan Tree Advisors. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, uh, so I had two questions. One was on the debt side of the business. When we look at YOI growth for the industry in SDFC AMC, uh, we have grown at a slower rate compared to the industry. Can you, you know, talk about uh, what's happening on the debt side for the industry and for us? What is the mix of growth in active versus passive? also on the shorter duration versus longer duration. So that's on the that. And the second was on the yield. So when we look at our yield improvement, we have seen like, you know, for uh, the, there has been a sequential improvement in the yields. Can you break this up for us? You know, what was the yield for the equity book and for the debt book separately? These are the two questions I had. Sure. So uh, on the debt side, your first question, uh so the debt market share has increased on a QOQ basis. The loss that you see on the YOY basis is uh, mainly due to our lower participation in debt index fund. We have mentioned it earlier uh, that our market share is lower there. Uh, some of the funds that got launched earlier uh, have been able to raise much more money than what we have been able to raise. Uh, but I wouldn't read too much into this. Our market share in debt, excluding index fund, on quarterly uh, average AUM basis for quarter ending September 23 stood at 14.5% uh, and was flat year on year. An actively managed fund, we continue to enjoy a very healthy market share, which has been pretty stable. I think the loss is on account of uh, the debt index fund. Uh, the, was looking for this principal uh, equity debt and, and liquid yield. So, so I think, Kunal, on equity, we are at uh, 67 basis points. Uh, we are at 27, 28 on, on debt and around 12 basis points on liquid. That's okay. Sure. And, and uh, Simil, on the incremental flows that you're getting, like it will be uh, lower than this. Have you seen any improvement in the incremental yields as well for the equity? No, no, of course it is It is lower than the book. So if we are not able to obviously get in uh, flows at uh, 67 kind of basis points. Uh, though uh, the NFOs that we did, all of them were at... Uh, 90, 100 basis points kind of uh, yield. You can see the direct plan expense ratio. They are all in that kind of a range. Uh, but flows into our larger schemes, uh, that is still in the band that we have mentioned in past, in that 50 to 60 kind of a range. Sure. Well, it makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. And on the debt side, what I wanted to understand more about was on the overall industry, you know, how the debt as a category is doing and how do we look at it from both, uh, you know, shorter and the longer duration uh, side of the thing and active debt from a longer term perspective because like in two, three, uh, 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 like four, three quarters back, we have talked about, you know, passive gaining growing at much faster rate. How, how do we look into the debt side of the business from a longer term perspective? So over a longer period, we have seen that uh, in an environment where interest rates are flat to declining, uh, we see greater flows into the fixed income versus the environment where rates have been going up in last couple of years. And that's why uh, in the last two financial years, we have seen net outflows from fixed income. Uh, last quarter was positive, and, but most of that money was at the short end of the curve. Uh, over the next several years, if you ask me, there is a lot of potential for us, when I say us, meaning industry as well as SDFC AMC, for us to grow on the fixed income side, both at the short end and the long end. 
the last couple of years, the greater growth has been on the equity side, but on, in the, on the retail side as well, there's a lot of opportunity. If you look at the overall fixed income AUM of the industry as a percentage of bank deposit, it has actually come down in the last four or five years. So I clearly see an opportunity. Of course, as an industry, we would have uh, liked the, uh, the tax regime to continue, which underwent a change, uh, as you are aware, in the last budget. Uh, but even, I mean, notwithstanding that, we would continue to work hard to promote uh, fixed income funds among larger set of investors. There's tremendous potential. Sure. Thank you so much. I'll get back in with you. All the very best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Swarnam Mukherjee from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity and congrats on a good set of numbers, sir. So, uh, first, uh, I think on the yield side, a uh, couple of quick questions. Uh, one is that you were mentioning 67 bips on the equity side, the yield is. So, just want to clarify, does that also include index fund or would, would that be classified separately under passive? And if so, then what would the yield be for the passive side of the portfolio? Actually, so of that includes index fund. So index fund is a very small part of the overall uh, pie, right? It is like 15, 16,000 crores on a 3 lakh crore kind of a number. Uh, the index funds, like if you look at the larger index funds, the Nifty 50 and the Sensex 30, uh, they would be around at whatever 12, 12, 13 basis points kind of a yield. And the equal weights and et cetera would be at around 25 basis points kind of a yield. But that would not really move the needle. It's a small part of the overall uh, uh, equity book. Right, sir. And also just wanted to confirm that uh, what you mentioned that the uh, yields for the flows in the existing uh, schemes in that 50, 60 bits kind of a range. So uh, does this hold steady or because, uh, you know, there has been flows that have come in over this quarter, particularly, I mean, I see, see the balanced advantage funds also gaining traction. Uh, additionally, I mean, it has, I think, now 60,000 crore plus. So is there some dilution because of increased flow and subsequently, you know, sizes of this fund moving up one notch higher? Uh, you can throw some color on that. And uh, also, I mean, so this kind of yield which we have seen this quarter, uh, what would be your view? Be should it sustain in when this security market continues to remain strong or would you still guide for some, you know, slow contraction in this? So I'll just answer your question on balance advantage and then Navneet can give a, a, a bigger picture. Uh, so on uh, if the f number that I mentioned of 50 to 60 basis points, that's on fresh flows. So what we do is when the expense ratio drops uh, because of the change in AUM, for future sales, we also reduce the commissions that we pay. So our yield thereby would be in that, in that broad band that I mentioned of 50 to 60 basis points. So uh, that was on your specific question. On overall yield, I think Navneet can throw better light. I mean, so we have always mentioned that book margin is higher than the flow margin, uh, mm -hmm. and that continues. But of course, the flow margin is now better than where it was, but still lower than our book margin, uh, the industry dynamic that most of you are aware of. Uh, also, you have to keep in mind the whole sliding scale structure. So we have seen our quarterly average equity AUM increase by 35% over the last one year. Many of the schemes have jumped multiple so-called hurdles, and the TRs are lower than uh, than where they were. So this, if you ask me, is a good problem to have. In fact, we have been mentioning this on every call because the absolute revenues are rising. Uh, but of course, as the size increases by multiple of 50 billion, you see a uh, uh, little pressure on margin. But the uh, the other important point is that the pace of dilution has slowed down due to rationalization of the distribution cost. And uh, I think Simul mentioned earlier that you would have seen the direct line TRs of some of the recently launched NFOs, not only for us, but even others in the industry. And uh, I, I must appreciate, I mean, if I look at the Bajaj Finance AMC, where their first scheme, one would have thought that they would pay out the maximum to, to you know, uh, uh, build a size, but their direct line TR, if I remember correctly, is close to 70 basis points. So we applaud them for, for standing ground. And uh, at our end, I think some of our recent NFOs, uh, you would have noticed, have come at a much higher margin. Hmm. Understood, sir. Very clear. Uh, I, I just had, uh, uh, you know, wanted to know uh, your thoughts on the expense side also. 
I think cost structure has slightly increased uh, uh, this quarter, both on the employee expense side and uh, on the other expense side. Uh, so, uh, if you if you could highlight in employee expense side, uh, so is this because of increase in manpower that is largely playing out, and then which parts of the team are you augmenting if it is an increase in manpower? Uh, and on the other expense side, is there anything else to read apart from maybe the marketing expenditure uh, coming due to NFOs? So on the employee side, it has grown by 11% YOI for quarter ended September 19, which is uh, pre-COVID. Our employee cost was uh, 57 odd crores. As against that, the employee cost for this quarter was 92, 92.9 crores. If we take out the non-cash cost of ESOP, then the number is 79.8 crores. So this is a CAGR of 8%. Uh, on the other expenses, so they have grown by 22% YOY. But if you look at in absolute amount terms, and this is the point that uh, Navzad and I have been making in last couple of calls, that it's about 12 crores of additional spend you would appreciate that the percentage looks higher on a lower base uh, and the increase is primarily due to increase in general business related expenses including travel, uh, we had a couple of NFOs, uh, business development, uh, trademark license fee, CSR expense of course, and, and, and we continue to spend on technology and digital. We think this is necessary and will benefit business materially over a period of time. So yourself, so just wanted to know your thoughts that you know the employee expense part. Overall, I think from the pre-COVID period, uh, I think that this point was made in the last quarter. That from quarter ended September 19, the CAGR on this front is nine percent. Also, Swarna, if I might just tell you one thing, I think you'll need to look at also the six monthly numbers. So I think 11 percent employee cost growth is September quarter 23 over 22. But if you look at a six monthly number for the current financial year, the people cost has kind of inflated by 9% on a YOI basis. Sir, I was actually looking at little bit sequentially. So first quarter versus this quarter, assuming that all the, uh, you know, increments, etc. were baked in first quarter. So the, from there also the number came in slightly higher. So just trying to delineate that. So uh, between the previous quarter and this quarter, the ESOP cost was uh, is higher by about two crores. That itself uh, adds additional element of cost. And mm -hmm. we did mention that the employee headcount has also gone up, of course, as much front end level at the sales uh, and front end and distribution level. But that also has added a bit. Okay, understood, sir. That that's what I what I to know. Uh, very helpful, sir. Thank you so much, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of prayers, Jain, from Motilal Oswal. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, on the step book, uh, could you give some understanding at the industry level as to what is the, I understand a large portion of uh, majority will be equity, but some specific as to what is the direct equity or hybrid uh, at the industry level and for GFC and so well. Hello. Fresh, we couldn't uh, get your question. Uh, the shift of share of equity and uh, hybrid. What is the share of equity and hybrid in SIP at the industry and for HDFC AMC? Oh, in the, okay, in the SIP, it would be, total SIP it, it would be 95, yeah, yeah. it is 95% uh, plus in, in, uh, it is, it is, it is, it is, in, it is well into 90, definitely well into 90. Okay. And pure equity or hybrid will be included. It'll be a mix of both equity as well as hybrid. Okay. okay. Got that, got that. And uh, you know, just extending the point of what you know uh, uh, previous previous guy was asking about the uh, employee cost, do you see essentially we have seen an increase of ten percent in employee cost. But you mentioned that there is you know, some additional ESOP cost, which was, I think, closer to two, two, two and a half or crores. Uh, apart from that, headcount increase would cause, would cause a 8% kind of an increase. So what was the total headcount that went up during this quarter? I'm just trying to, even because the reason why I'm asking this question is to understand when do we see the scale benefits really 
benefiting the EBITDA margin, profitability, uh, or you know, uh, and you know, we've been investing into expenses for the last uh, two or three years now. Uh, so when do we really see the scale benefits benefiting the profitability at the company level? <laughs> Clearly benefiting. You are seeing the uh, increase in market share. You have seen a uh, tremendous amount of, you know, the new products. Over the last uh, two and a half, three years, we have done almost 40 new products. We are investing in our active, continue to invest in our, continue to expand our, our systematic transaction book. We have continuously been uh, investing into, like, developing all, all, all possible channels. So I think it's just clear the, the results are very, very, uh, visible, I guess. Actually, Prash, on a lighter note, uh, we've been kind of asked by some of the global uh, uh, shareholders uh, saying that how are you guys managing a 229 offices, 1,500 people, uh, 5 trillion rupee assets under management by spending under 700 crores a year? Servicing tens of thousands of distributors. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so if you look at it, I think our uh, if, and I think even on people costs, I think our inflation. If you look at it, it's been in that just about double-digit kind of number, right? If you look at both 10, 11, 12 percent is what the what the people cost we are talking about. See, we would request you to not look at a Q on Q because there are certain things that kind of get accounted for. We kind of looking at how the dynamics of the business are playing out. We kind of provision for bonuses because, of course, people is the people are the key to our business, and we need to be fairly sensitive to that. Also, you would have noticed that our operating expenses as a percentage of AUM is now 13 basis point uh, against 14 and thanks to higher growth in AUM as compared to growth in cost. Great, great. Uh, just one more question. You know, we have almost now closer to 6,000 crores of investments and uh, equivalents. Uh, any thoughts of utilization of that? Uh, that will be Yeah, so uh, our dividend payout ratio for financial year 23 was increased to 72 percent, right? Uh, we obviously can't second guess uh, what the board would uh, what the board would decide, but we should continue to see an upward sloping trend on dividend payout ratio. Uh, we of course need capital for skin in the game circular, uh, skin in the game compliance. Uh, currently, that number is about 500 crores is skin in the game investments from to our own. We are intending to see some upcoming funds in Gift City from our balance sheet. We already invested a lot of capital from our balance sheet in the AIF strategy that we have launched. And uh, we do we do look at all acquisition opportunities that come by. Uh, so having cash on hand does help uh, at that point. Very, very good. Uh, yeah, I think that would be it from Thank you. Next question is from the line of Lalit Deo from Equal Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. I congratulate you. Well, you, but your voice is not coming clear. Can you please speak through the handset? Yes. Yeah, is this better? Yes. Yes. So, just wanted to understand, so like, uh, if we see the equity AUM channel mix, so we see that the share of direct channel, uh, the share of direct, uh, direct own uh, originated equity AUM has increased. So just wanted to know your thoughts on on the channel-wise market share on the flow side, like where we are seeing the most improvement in our market share across which channels. And that would be my first question. And the second question will be, uh, uh, so now with the change of control uh, to SDFC Bank now, so what are the changes which we have done at the ground level uh, to improve uh, the mix, uh, to improve the contribution from HDFC Bank to HDFC AMC? So I think I'll just take the first part of your direct plan. So I think we have always maintained the direct plan book share is around whatever 22, 23%. But as against that, the flow share is in late 20s. So you are seeing the one reason for tilt towards more and more towards direct plan is because of that. Secondly, even if you assume flat market, flat uh, no flows, uh, the direct plan does have a lower expense ratio. And thereby you will see a 20 to 30 basis points positive impact on, on the share there on an annual basis. So that is one part, and uh, Navneet would address the whole HDFC bank. So uh, we are seeing the uh, material uh, improvement in the engagement with SDFC bank, and we'll continue to work on strengthening it further. 
Um, the kind of support we have been getting from the bank is encouraging. We are deeply involved with them and uh, alignment of interest after the merger is definitely a tailwind. Uh, you all know, I mean, the bank is a formidable distribution machine and uh, we will put in enough and more efforts to capitalize on it. We have now created a dedicated vertical to look after the HDFC bank channel. Uh, while bank has been maintaining an open architecture approach uh, as a distributor, but given the range of products across various asset classes, given the long-term track record that we have built, and the brand familiarity and all the other efforts we are making, uh, we are confident in gaining share in LTFC bank system. And uh, I'm happy to state that our uh, flow market share in banks book is higher than the book market share for the last couple of months. Sure, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Sahaj Mittal. From 3P Investment Managers, please go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening, uh, team. Uh, first of all, congratulations on a good set and commendable performance. Uh, so, uh, if I look at your September, so I mean, for the first five odd months, you have been clearly uh, sweeping the table in terms of net equity flows, right? Uh, but if I look at September number, uh, September flows, net equity. Flows, Flows, there seems to be some sharp uh, drop in your in HDFC AMC's uh, market share. So, is there any particular reason for that? I think so. See, month on month, there could always be volatility. It depends on some of the NFOs that get allocated uh, allotted in that particular month or some other factors. So, wouldn't read too much into it. But overall, that trend has been efforts for us, and as I mentioned, uh, it's across channels and, and across products, and, and we have been very pleased by the trend that we have been seeing. Yeah. In a particular month, there could be like always one or two NFOs of competition that can impact the market share, and flows, as you know, in September were lower than the flows in, in August, and within that, if there are one or two large NFOs by some players, that can impact few basis point here and there. But otherwise, I think whether it's on the systematic side as well as on the uh, gross lump sum flows, we have, we, are, we have been seeing encouraging trend. Uh, got it, got it. And on the staff cost, even if... And thank you for the compliments. Um, and if I look at your staff cost, even for the for, for FI23, right, there's been some uh, sporadic movements. So from here on, uh, are we saying that the staff cost will remain at uh, these levels, 93-odd crores, uh, in the second half as well? I think an annual increase of, in, increase of like high single digit, low double digit type you should expect. And as you mentioned that, you would have seen the increase in headcount. We continue to invest in our business. We remain very optimistic about, about the potential of our business. We mentioned about a new vertical for LTFC Bank and a couple of other efforts that we have been making to, to enhance our reach. Uh, so adjusted for both, both I mean, uh, increase for the existing set of people as well as the new headcount, it should be, a, I mean, low double-digit kind of number or, or high single-digit kind of number that should be. And I also mentioned about the last four or five years, I think it's been pretty reasonable. Got it, got it. And uh, some guidance on uh, ESOP bit uh, for the second half and for the next two years? Actually, we had mentioned this in our uh, call in uh, April when we allotted the stock option, that the annual cost, uh, which is basically driven by black shows on the basis of accounting, uh, the first year cost, if I remember, the total cost, if I remember correctly, of the entire issue was around 55 crores, and it roughly gets spread 60% in the first year, 30 odd uh, in the second and balance in the third year. That's how the, the vesting schedule amortizes the cost of the option. That would continue. So, to your point, uh, next year, for example, uh, the non cash comp uh, would come down because 60% of the cost would have been taken in the first year of, of the issue. Got it. Got it. Uh, thanks and uh, all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Madhukar Ladda from Noama Wealth Management. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, no, good evening. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yes. Hi. 
uh, uh, congratulations on a good uh, all-round operating performance. And, uh, you know, most of my questions have been answered. Just, uh, you know, a couple of small ones. One, uh, you've given your uh, active uh, equity AUM, and I think you also mentioned what the industry uh, number was in the beginning, uh, but I missed that. So can you uh, can you give me what the, what your market share is and how that has moved in active equity AUM? Maybe, you know, uh, last couple of years, what has happened over there? Yeah, it is there in the presentation, Madhuga. So we have gone to equity, uh, active equity September QA UM at 12.4 percent. A year back, this number was 11.5 percent. But that is uh, that isn't that the total uh, on a total AUM basis? So no, that is actively managed. Active if you go to slide number 11 on the presentation, it has this detail. Okay, okay, maybe I missed that. Second. Uh, if uh, you mentioned 67 basis points is uh, Q2 uh, yield on equity, uh, that also includes the index fund yield. Uh, can we uh, get the number for the last quarter? What has happened quarter over quarter? I think it is same. I think it is just 67, 68 is the 68. 68 is the yeah. One or two basis. Then maybe we mentioned the reasons also. I think there are two main reasons. One is that the book margin is higher than the flow margin, and second also the sliding scale structure. So if market has gone up and, and, and some of the funds have crossed that uh, 50 billion hurdle, you will see one or two basis point uh, uh, impact on margins on those particular products. And, and in the last two quarters, we have seen some of couple of our, our, our products crossing that hurdle, which is like a good dilution to have. I'm happy with that dilution because in absolute terms, we are making more money. Right, right. Sure, those were the only remaining questions. Uh, thank you and all the best. Thank you, Madhukar. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Sagar Doshi from Fintuit Investments. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening. So I would like to ask what is the approach for ETFs? So HDFC is playing a bit defensive on ETFs and index funds. So don't uh, or what is your view of increasing the share of ETFs in our portfolio or what is uh, the structure like the five years down the line how do you see ETFs as a part of the overall book if you can throw some light on it yeah I mean we have always mentioned that uh, active and passive investment strategies will coexist harmoniously rather than competing at each other's expense uh, India is uh, substantially underpenetrated so Indian markets will chart their own course, and uh, I think we don't need to move assets from active to passive the way it may have happened in some of the markets where institutions would have moved their assets. Our stance on active is very well established. We hold a very strong belief in its potential. We see substantial alpha opportunities that are still available in India. If you look at uh, all our equity products, I think I remember two, three years back, a lot of people used to say when there was a period of one or two years where active funds were finding it difficult to generate alpha. But you look at uh, all our products in last uh, one year, two years, three years, they've been able to generate uh, very good, very, very, very decent alpha. Uh, but on the passive side, we have significantly expanded our product offering. And uh, now we would have around 20 index fund and almost 20 ETFs. So we're like 40 products. It's absolutely best in class. We continue to invest in, in the distribution capability on that side. If you look at our, our, our uh, uh, digital journey or, or the efforts that we are making on content, marketing, everything. So our, our goal has been to serve as a one-stop destination, offering a complete product range to cater to all our in customers' investment needs. So, I mean, a customer needs an active product, we have best-in-class uh, portfolio. A customer needs passive, we have an absolutely best-in-class portfolio with uh, best in class journey. Okay. Um, so you are not looking to increase your ETF market share, if I say? No, so large part of the ETF book in India has been built through the uh, flows from pension fund, which, as you are aware, uh, goes to a couple of AMCs, uh, which is which is based on, on the allocation by the EPFO. And some of the exempted, exempted funds also follow the uh, same pattern. 
And then you have some of the other ETFs like the Bharat 22, CPSC, and then uh, Bharat Bond, etc., where, where I think none of the other AMCs can participate. But barring that, as I mentioned, that we have done large uh, number of product uh, launches, and, and we have got a dedicated channel with a senior person leading it, and, and, and people across functions uh, kind of like trying their best to, to enhance our presence, and then and that's where You've seen like a couple of our products, like our Bankex, which was a very small product, less than 100 crores or so, is now over 20 billion rupees. And then we continue to look at the potential of each and every product on an independent basis and trying our best. We have been also doing a lot of uh, efforts on, on promoting the concept of, of ATS, index funds, uh, to of investors who are looking at that segment. Okay. Um, that is helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Abhijit from Kodak Mandra Bank. Please go ahead. Hey, hi. Good evening. Um, so question on uh, net flow market share uh, in equities. So if it's possible uh, to quantify how that has trended uh, now versus 12 months back, so that would be a helpful number to look at. But uh, more importantly, uh, you know, given the excellent fund performance, do you think the flow market share, uh, specifically in the non-HDFC bank channel, has uh, sort of reached a stage which, uh, you know, largely seems reasonable and appropriate? Or or you think there is still uh, quite a lot of potential for us to improve? Um, and... Uh, and as far as HDFC Bank goes, if you could uh, give some granular details uh, in terms of how the interests are aligning. Uh, uh, you mentioned you gave some comments earlier on, but when do we really start? Uh, you know, see that. When do we start to see that uh, reflected in numbers? So first of all, aspirations are always uh, doing more than what we have done, doing better than what we have been doing, and I think the brand we we represent. Uh, the distribution network, given our top-of-the-line uh, digital infrastructure, given our uh, given the efforts we are we are making on the marketing side, product content, every single thing, uh, we continue to aspire for higher market share. And on both sides, I think uh, getting greater share of uh, lump sum flows as well as uh, bigger focus has also been on uh, growing our systematic transaction volume. Uh, I'm sure you would have noticed that in September 23 are inflows from systematic transactions, which include both SIP as well as uh, systematic transfer plan. That has reached uh, 22.4 billion, which is up from 14.3 billion in September 22. So it's a substantial increase. And uh, with everything that we are doing, we continue to aspire for higher market share than, than where we are. Got it. And just a follow-up uh, on the SIP, um, you know, investor behavior, sort of an open-ended question, but behaviorally, uh, are you seeing, uh, you know, people who come in, in the last two, three years uh, sort of uh, behaving differently in terms of remaining invested for longer uh, or wanting to still, you know, uh, cash out and book gains given how the markets have been behaving? Uh, any comments there would be helpful. So <laughs> I can't comment for people who have come in last one year, how will they behave. But I think the trend is very encouraging over the last couple of years, the way uh, the concept of SIP, the way it has become a household name, and uh, the level of interest among you know investors from all strata of society is very, very encouraging. And uh, across all channels, we are seeing uh, everyone focusing on building their systematic transaction book. And uh, I think I mentioned earlier that we have always been highly focused on that segment of the market. We have always promoted the concept of, you know, the power of compounding, long-term investment, disciplined investing, and uh, that has kept us in good stead. And, and as an industry also, we continue to make efforts that people look at, uh, you know, equity investing from a, from a very long-term perspective and don't get swayed by volatility, but take advantage of it by, remaining disciplined and NSIP is a great tool for that. So, of course, I mean, in the last one or two years, uh, the newer investors who have joined, uh, I think time will tell. But we remain confident that with all the efforts industry is making in terms of investor education and what individual fund houses are doing, uh, the behavior will, 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 will continue to improve. Got it. Thanks a lot and all the best. Thank you.
Thank you. Next question is from the line of Dipanjan Ghosh from City. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good evening. A few questions from my side. First, uh, you uh, you alluded to the fact that you know because of higher AUM growth, some of your schemes have changed labs um, for the past few months or quarters. So just wanted to get some sense when you mentioned this number of 67 and a half bits of net yield on your uh, equity fund. Uh, will the exit run rate also be similar? I mean, uh, I mean, I would assume that this is the average uh, for the quarter. Uh, or should we see some more impact uh, over the next uh, few months? Uh, second one. Sorry, can, uh, you, can you repeat that? Uh, I didn't get so, it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you mentioned that your net uh, yield from the equity funds is around 67 and a half bits. Uh, now, I would assume that this is average for the quarter, but because over the last three months, which is July, August, uh, September, uh, most of your equity schemes have changed slab. So, has the entire impact of changing slab reduction in gross PER uh, captured in this net realization number, or uh, the exit run rate, let's say, in September or October uh, will be somewhat different from 67 and a half? Uh, as you may mix, has not changed. So, Dipanjan, if the AUM remains constant where it is, right, for the next uh, 90 days, it would be 67, assuming there are no inflows, no outflows. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, second uh, question on the distribution part. Um, uh, you know, on the equity mix, we have seen uh, increase in national distributors and decrease in uh, MFDs, uh, considerably over the, trailing, uh, over, over the last 12 months. So, uh, I would assume that the flow movement would be even... Uh, uh, even higher, uh, or higher, skew, higher uh, more skewed towards NDs. Uh, so just wanted to get some, uh, and in this context, on your equity-oriented market share gains, uh, you know, if I split it between retail and HNI based on MP classification, it seems a lot of it is driven by HNI segment. So can you just strangulate this distribution mix change and your equity market share gains and what is really happening out there? Not much on that front. I think few basis points here and there. There could also be a possibility. I'm just guessing that uh, some of the national distributors who also do aggregation by, you know, uh, kind of a JV or an acquisition of, of some of the MFDs, and if that AUM shifts from an MFD and get classified as an ND, that could be one reason. But otherwise, not uh, much of change in the overall trend. I think uh, almost all the channels continue to to grow their book. Uh, your other question was on. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So th this was the part. I mean, so broadly, uh, you would allude, uh, probably you are saying that you know it is more of a movement of agents towards more of a sub broker. Oh, I, I think I think few basis points okay. here and there. Uh, there could be. Also, I think some large transactions can yeah. stay right. One large private bank, which like like say somebody like a Julius Bar goes into. Uh, national distributor and they get in some large money from one family. Those things can kind of skew things here there, but okay. not something yeah. there, there's no distinct trend as such. Yeah. Got it, got it. Lastly, one data keeping question. Uh, see, when I look at your uh, employee base movement uh, during the quarter, obviously it has increased uh, quite a bit. So just wanted to get some sense of whether the entire fixed cost of that has been captured in this quarter's base or uh, some of it might, uh, you know, get captured um, in 3Q or 4Q. I mean, uh, uh, so yeah, you are right. I mean, we were around 12.50 odd in March 21, and uh, now we are at 14.39. So if you look at the overall growth of our business, uh, that's not much. Uh, we continue to believe that uh, business has a lot of runway for growth, and the headcount increase is on account of, you know, we, we are also developing new businesses. But large number of people would be in sales and distribution. Whether heavy lifting is, yeah, I, I think... A lot of heavy lifting has already been done. Uh, this would have got captured, but of course, I think if somebody joined yesterday, their, their salary bill will be will be there for the rest of the year. But I don't think it's it's really going to substantially move the needle. Got it. But thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Saurabh from J P Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, so just three questions. One is on page seventeen. So, HDFC, you know, you guys have... Sorry to interrupt you, but we are losing your audio in between. Can you please speak through the handset? Yeah, this is better now. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, this is better now. Yeah, 
Yeah, so, so basically just on page 17 of the presentation, so you guys have seemed to have added almost 40% of the incremental, you know, in a unique investors uh, in the industry. So we, we talk about like what's driving that. Is it just performance or is there something else? Uh, second is just on this HTC bank point, how much is bank, uh, I mean, how much are you at the percentage of bank's distribution uh, of mutual funds? And the third is, uh, any thoughts on the revised consultation paper at Yes, Thank you. So on the uh, unique customers, I think, yeah, you noticed it rightly that uh, I think we've been able to capture a very high market share among the new, I mean, the unique investors that have got added to the to the industry. And uh, the reason are, I think, a mix of several things. Of course, our performance in most categories uh, is top notch that's clearly helping us with all the other efforts that we are making whether on on uh, better engagement with distribution with top of line digital infrastructure with all the marketing uh, efforts uh, so on and so forth and it's across channels uh, so it's whether it's national distributors banks uh, mfds uh, as well as fintechs who have also been growing quite fast in terms of uh, number of uh, new investors that, that are coming to the industry and, and we are present across all channels and remain highly focused on, on that. The question of his was HDFC bank book market share and flow market share. So I, I mentioned earlier that flow market share is, is higher than the uh, book market share. So of their book, uh, sort of the book market share would be in the 25 to 30 percent range. Uh, on flows, we are definitely getting more than that. And lastly was the new TR uh, regulation. So there, uh, honestly, I have nothing new to say on that. The status quo is where we are. Uh, we have discussed this before, so won't repeat much on that. But one thing I, I would like to add that the idea of regulator was to pass the benefit of economies of scale to the investor. And in that regard, we as Association of Mutual Funds of India, as well as individual AMCs, have presented the data to to regulator, and uh, in, in fact, uh, it will be interesting to cite data for one of our funds for reference. Uh, that what is that has been presented to the to the regulator by the industry. So let me give you one example that uh, our largest equity oriented fund is uh, LDFC Balance Advantage Fund. The current AUM of that is around 64-65,000 crores and the regular plan TR as per formula comes to 1.45%. Regulations were modified in April 2009 and at that point in time this fund had an AUM of 40,000 crores and the TR at then, that point in time was 1.78. So over the last say 3-4 odd years TR has gone down by 33 basis points or for that matter by around 19-20%. So economies of scale has actually been passed out to the investor. And I will take this opportunity to sincerely compliment CB. Uh, they dived into data and heard us out. Uh, and you all have heard what chairperson had to say in the following press conference. But uh, yeah, we have nothing more to say on that. Thank you, sir. This is very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is a front line of pages from PEFD. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, yes. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, pages, yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, congratulations on getting five trillion mark. Uh, my first question is what will be your guidance for the upcoming financial year? Uh, pages, we don't make any guesses. Uh, you appreciate, right? Our business does kind of depend a lot on how the equity markets move. So we don't want to even hazard a guess there. Okay, uh, so my second question would be, what would be the important factors that would be uh, the biggest reasons um, in making you hit the 5 trillion mark as well as gaining such a huge market share? So I mean, a variety of things. Uh, I mean, uh, I've mentioned and maybe in, in, in different uh, contexts, I think the brand that we represent the presence that we have, the partnerships that we have built over the years, I think our, our product range, uh, the performance track record that we have, one of the longest running track record of, of our, our funds, uh, it's a combination of, of all of that. Uh, okay, sure. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next question is from the line of Mohan from BOV Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity and congratulations on a good set of numbers. Uh, just one question in terms of unique customers. Now we have got good 20%. So just wanted to understand their behavior in terms of how sticky they are. And if you could throw some light in terms of, you know, who are these customers in terms of age group, profession, that is salaried or self-employed, that would be helpful. Uh, uh, we we sure. don't have uh, that data readily available, uh, Mohit. Maybe we'll reach out to you and, and try and share that information. Uh, in terms of uh, staying uh, on equity side, if you look at it, uh, the average holding period, now there is no real science behind it. One way to do that would be based on existing uh, book that does rest with us, but that would kind of get skewed because of large amount of new additions in the last uh, 12, 24, 36 months. Uh, the other way to look at it is look at people who are exiting out of, uh, out of us, but uh, that would kind of uh, ignore people who continue to stay with us. So there is no real science, uh, but some data that ANSI had published uh, uh, did state that the average holding period is sub three years. Okay, so but that sub three years, I think it's for the industry. So that holds true for US. It is, it is, it is slightly better for us. All right, all right. Yeah, thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take the last question from the line of Amrish, individual investor. Please go ahead. Um, thank you for the opportunity and congratulations on a fantastic set of results and operation. operation Amrish, numbers. sorry to interrupt. Uh, there's one yeah, number. So to speak yeah. a little louder, please. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, congratulations. And there's one particular operation number I'd like to uh, get some in, uh, further input on. So follow up to the individual investor, so to the individual customer question. If you look even at our uh, uh, individual folios, this is now really accelerated in the last two quarters, and of course this quarter has been fantastic. Our average AUM seems to be more or less holding steady, average AUM per folio. So we are getting more than just you know one customers. We're getting multiple folios from them, uh, and this now number looks. Uh, as similar to what we were maybe in March 21, uh, is this is it fair to interpret this that this should therefore then follow on and we should maybe see even revenue market share go up, AU and market share go up uh, to similar levels at, at a later date? We didn't exactly understand your question. So you are saying uh, AUM per customer is uh, is good. That's what you are suggesting. Yes. No, so the number of folios is increasing very fast. Right. So our, our, share, our share of folios today is now at uh, at a level which was similar to what it was in March 21. Understood. And in March 21, yeah, and and, our, and and you could say, you know, folio can go up, but the average AUM per folio can go down, but that's not happening. So our folio, also average AUM per folio is staying more or less constant. So it's not just people being added for the sake of it. So if if that's uh, the starting basis, which means it's a strong foundation, as a lead indicator, in in March 21, we were probably 13.5 or 13.6% AUM market share. We are today uh, slightly less. Is this a fair way to interpret that maybe, uh, not, 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 not for go forward guidance, but is it a way to interpret that some of the market, uh, the AUM benefits actually come later after the polio has been added? I don't know if you are, because you are looking at the overall AUM where there could be institutional yeah. investors and there could be like flows into the ETFs, etc. and then trying to divide that number and, and arriving at that confusion. Oh, no, no, individual. So Only individual AUM. I'm not looking at so, but what happens is, see, when you look at the total AUM and divide that by individual folios, right, it might not really give you the right data because uh, there are large institutions who are investors in liquid funds and, and debt funds. Also, Navneet earlier mentioned yeah, no. about the whole ETF business. Sorry. It, yeah, individual AUM divided by individual folios. I'm not I'm separating the institutions. Right, right. Because some, some part of that growth would have also come in from mark to market changes in equity, right? So that's the reason you might be kind of getting that data. Yes, of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. The, 
But if I look across, you know, the last 15, 16 quarters, the, this number, you know, has not changed at all. And it, it's higher than the, than the market average. So it, our folio, AUM folio is higher than what the market has. So if our market share of folios is increasing and our average revenue per individual folio is higher than the market, it should... Oh, so you are, your, your, inference right. uh, your inference is right, saying that this is a positive signal. We, we agree to that, sir. Absolutely. Let's hope the trend continues. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Navneet Munod for closing comments. Thank you all for attending the call. Uh, Thank you very much. On behalf of HDFC Asset Management Company Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.